everyone, I'm Amy Sandler, Chief Marketing Officer and a coach at Radical Candor. I am so excited to welcome you back to the Radical Candor podcast. We have been on hiatus for far too long, and we're so excited to bring to you the Radical Candor 2.0 podcast. This version will feature our very own Kim Scott, author of Radical Candor and co-founder of our executive education company, as well as Jason Rosoff, our CEO and co-founder. I'll be your host. We're going to have lots of great guests along the way, too. We're going to explore how to actually practice radical candor, really digging into what it means to become more radically candid. We want to help you get better at doing all the things you want to do so you can get more stuff done without being a jerk. And we'll explore why this is so hard. So we'll give you some really practical tips so that we can all keep becoming better humans. The conversations will be casual and candid. We're going to be improvising a lot of this. And so we're going to kick things off now with a special episode. This originally aired as a live conversation between Kim Scott and our partner in our new venture, Improvising Radical Candor. This is Kelly Leonard from Second City Works. And Kim and Kelly talk about how to lead with kindness and clarity through a crisis. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason Rosoff, and Jason will be your host for this discussion. Enjoy. Thank you so much for joining us for what we hope to be the first of uh, many of these types of conversations. Um, I'm Jason. I'm the CEO of Radical Candor. I will also be uh, the producer slash host uh, of this show. Um, So you'll see me a couple of times uh, now and and then when we get to to Q&A. Um, and it'll be my, my pleasure to, to facilitate that Q&A uh, with Kim and Kelly when we get there. But for now, uh, why don't I turn it over uh, to Kelly Leonard, uh, who is the author of Yes And and uh, our partner at The Second City. Kelly, take it away. Thanks, Jason. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am the executive director of learning and applied improvisation at the Second City. Um, and we did this uh, uh, webinar last Wednesday, but there was such demand that most people who signed on uh, couldn't get in. So we're doing it again. Um, I'm here with Kim Scott. Uh, and let's go over the agenda before we jump into our content. Um, the first thing we're going to do um, is uh, uh, talk about this idea of checking in. And I'm going to hold that for a second because we're going to do it. Um, then we're going to talk about the Radical Candor Framework. Um, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into what we mean when we say uh, you should have an improv mindset, especially in a crisis. And then we're going to talk about uh, how to lead, collaborate, and stay connected inside a, cr- a crisis. And, and there's three sort of areas we're going to cover. Building trust through caring and challenging, uh, transparency and authenticity, and give you some practical tips that you can at the end. Um, so, Kim, one of the things that you and I have talked about uh, is this importance, especially right now, and it was important before, but especially right now, of what it means to check in. Uh, so, uh, how are you? <laughs> things are much better. Things are looking up today. My husband was uh, was quarantined, was isolated in our house. He went down to this little room off the garage, and I was kind of slipping food uh, onto the top of the stairs above the garage, and he was creeping up to get it. And obviously, I was pretty sure he was okay, but it's always a worry, and I just missed him, uh, and and I missed his help as well. So I'm really happy to report that he has no fever and is back up with us. Good, 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 good. Um, So I'm in the attic of my home in the northwest side of Chicago, um, which is where I've been working. So if you hear a a bark or two, that is my 100-pound Bernese Mountain Dog named Benchley. Um, So uh, because, you know, that happens. Uh, And I'm doing okay. I mean, literally, the last two weeks have been Second City taking a 60-year-old live entertainment and training company and turning it into an online uh, entertainment and training company. Uh, But it's actually kind of working. Uh, we have 80% retention in our students uh, for our training center, and we're going to start doing shows uh, on, on Zoom, uh, hopefully as soon as next week. Um, so yeah, it's, it's amazing. A, it is. like it's so so it, it's scared like everyone's scared. 
but also sort of marveling at the ways people are coming together. And we, Kim, you and I t- touched on this this morning, right? When we were looking at Twitter and yes. there's an a academic out there who said that actually in a crisis, more people do behave well than, than don't. Yeah, so I think uh, that was, thank you for sharing that with me this yeah. morning. It was very comforting because I think one of one of my anxieties is, is the social fabric going to come unraveled. And the evidence is that it will actually be strengthened by the crisis. It won't be weakened. Yeah, I think that's an important way to enter it. And it's not to minimize people's suffering. It is not to, you know, not pay attention to the stark reality, which is not good. But as human beings, you know, we know that we do not operate at our best when we're in our fear brain. Yeah. Um, that, that is not the way that we operate best. So much better to work from a growth mindset that's very akin to an improv mindset. And then it calls for this level of clarity in communication, which is to- total radical candor. So I think that's probably the best place for us to start is just giving a sort of framework for those people who might not know what radical candor is. Great. So the idea of radical candor is actually really simple. It's about caring personally and challenging directly at the same time. And I I think the good news is that I've seen some of the best examples of this that I've ever seen, both from leaders and also from from the guy who was checking me out at the grocery store the other day, like where people really take a moment to do what you just did for me, Kelly, and to check in with one another, but also to, to say when they need some help. So for example, the radical candor I got in the grocery store was the guy who was checking me out was like, bag the groceries yourself, which I should have figured out myself, but I needed him to tell me. So so that was a little radical candor and I appreciated it. And then as I was bagging, we had this very kind of intimate and and satisfying conversation about about how our respective families were doing. So So a small example of radical candor in the moment. However, it's also important to understand what radical candor is not. We said that very often a crisis brings out the very best in people, but occasionally it brings out the worst. And I think it's more important than ever to learn how to hold up a mirror to people when the crisis is bringing out their worst. So one of the things that happens very often when we're stressed out is we we act in, in a way that I call obnoxious aggression. That's where you do challenge someone else but you fail to tell them that you really care. So I was trying to get my kids to help me vacuum before I came up here. And I'm afraid I fell into the obnoxious aggression quadrant, even though on the other day when we talked, I promised I wouldn't do that. And that time it was over the dishes. So it's so easy when, when we're stressed out, there's a lot going on to, to remember to challenge people, but to forget to show them that we care. And I think that more now than ever, it's important to start with that that sort of reminder to ourselves and to others of our shared humanity and to, and to take a moment to show we care. Not forever, but just, just a moment to show that you care. Now, sometimes what happens in a crisis is kind of the opposite of obnoxious aggression. It's what I call ruinous empathy. And that's where we're so concerned about the people around us. And we realize that they are stretched to their limits. And so we don't tell them something that they really need to know. We don't ask them for the help that we really need. Like I really needed my kids to help me with the vacuuming. I couldn't do it all and get up here at the same time. And so I think it's it's really important in a time of crisis to remember, yes, your compassion is so important. And your truth is equally as important. If you sort of abstract radical candor out to its its most abstract level, it's about love and truth at the same time. So ruinous empathy is what happens when you do remember to show love, but you forget about the importance of, of sharing your truth. And last but not least, there's manipulative insincerity. And this is the very worst way to respond to a crisis, although it's also very human. So we need to have compassion for ourselves and not use this framework to judge ourselves or to judge other people. But manipulative insincerity is what happens when we when we don't say what needs saying and we forget to show that we care about the other person. We just kind of pull into our shell turtle-like. And Of course, we all need to do that from time to time. We need a little bit of self-care, but don't forget to reemerge from your shell and to see the people around you 
and to show them that you love them. Shower the people you love with love like never before. But but love is not all we need. We also need truth. Uh, tell them the truth about what's going on. Does that make sense, Kelly? Yeah, and I think it's also important to know that this isn't static conditions, right? Yes. <laughs> You're, uh, all of us are floating between these at any given time, which is why understanding uh, that when you do fall into obnoxious aggression, it's right. going to happen. So then you can pivot uh, and move into the more care personally. So you can you can move from obnoxious aggression to radical candor if you grab onto your care. And the person across from you knows that you care, right? Yes, exactly. And I, I think it's also important to remember that you want to move in the right direction, not in the wrong direction when you find yourself yeah. in a quadrant you don't want to be in. So very often when we realize we've acted like a jerk, the temptation is to move the wrong direction on challenge directly rather than moving the right direction on care personally. So if you realize you've been a jerk, don't pretend like say, oh, I didn't really mean it. It's no big deal if it is a big deal. But do take a moment to show that you care. So one of the reasons I think it's important to understand that these aren't static conditions is because that's a thing improvisation uh, does. Yes. Um, it is a practice in a world that is constantly being written in the moment. So, you know, when groups of people are making nothing, making something out of nothing, uh, that's a very, very hard uh, thing to do. Uh, so we have all these this training and these exercises in these practices. Um, and they teach people to see all obstacles as gifts. Um, they make mistakes work for you. Um, they, we have the notion that all of us are better than one of us. Um, and we have a concept called follow the follower, which in essence is the servant leadership model. Uh, so it actually emanates out of a game. And the game is where uh, a group uh, of, of students are in a room and they're told to walk around the room sort of slowly making eye contact. One person is secretly told they're the leader and their job is to find someone to trade off that leadership with. So you have to, without speaking, trade off that leadership. And then someone uh, will pick it up and then they do the same. Um, and it was funny, uh, we were demonstrating this at the Spurtis um, Institute here in Chicago this many years back. And my friend Hal Lewis, who was running the Spurtis then, was like, you guys are doing Peter Drucker. And I was like, I don't know who Peter Drucker is. <laughs> uh, so now I do. Um, and just an, a, a cutting edge management theorist um, uh, and consultant who believed way long ago that hierarchies are not the best way to get things done uh, and that individuals need to lead at every level that they're at. Um, and when we, when we are too hierarchical, um, that's when problems happen. And I host a podcast called Getting DS And, and I remember having on um, this guy, Eric McNulty uh, from Harvard, terrific book called You're It. And he was researching uh, the response to the uh, Boston Marathon bombing and when he went to go look for who the leader was, there wasn't one. What everyone did was knew how to lead, how to trade off, and they trusted each other. And they were very well prepared because there's so many of these historical events that happened in Boston that their crisis management team was already put in place. And so I think we can kind of can see the effects of this right now. What are, who has the teams and who has the mindset uh, that they are going to be able to move swiftly, communicate with, with each other um, clearly, uh, and then who doesn't? <laughs> yes, yeah, we're seeing we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, it, we're seeing. I've certainly noticed some of the best examples of leadership and some of the worst examples. So one of the one of the best examples I saw recently was a leader who gave everybody on their team a four day weekend when as we went into working from home and said, take Friday and take Monday and figure out how you're going to rearrange your life and so that you can take care of whoever is at home with you. And, and, and then also how you can still show up for work when, when possible. And this person also sort of identified what work still needed to be done, but also identified work and asked the team to identify work that they could just stop doing for this period uh, in recognition of the fact that, that this is, puts a lot of burden. This situation puts a lot of burden on everybody and different kinds of burdens. You can't offer the same solution. People who are at home alone need different things than people who are at home with six kids who need to be educated. So, so that's one of the best examples. One of the worst examples I've seen is, is a, 
a leader who installed spyware basically on everybody's computer so that they could see how long everyone was working every day. And so that was, that was to put it mildly, not helpful for morale. And, you know, that's kind of a funny story, but in all seriousness, can we get political just for a second here? A little bit. A little bit. (laughs) <laughs> We've seen some of the very worst examples of, yes. of leadership. We've seen leaders who are spouting arbitrary BS, who are pretending that they know what they don't know, which is very dangerous. And we've saw, seen some great leadership recently. I, mm-hmm. I was watching Cuomo's, Cuomo's uh, sort of uh, talks recently. Okay. Yeah, and I think he does. I think he does a few things really well. He first of all, he remembers to show he cares personally. He said the other day, "We're not sacrificing anybody. Everybody is important." So he remembers to show humanity, and at the same time, he tells the truth, even when the truth is a little bit scary. But he gives the numbers, and people people can people can deal with big challenges, but this total uncertainty is what is so hard to deal with. So when he has numbers and facts to give, he gives them. And he also takes action. So so he said, you know, there are four things we need to do, social distancing, testing, and he took action on testing. He's, and he gave the numbers. He said, <laughs> until February 28th, only 472 people had been tested in the United States, States by the by the CDC's tests, which weren't working that well. And he actually lifted a bunch of bureaucracy and allowed uh, New York's Department of Health to develop its own test. And that made a, that has made a big difference to New Yorkers. He talked about masks and the importance of masks. By the way, there's this great website called masksnow.org. This is something we, you can put your kids to work making masks and it can actually make a big difference. Uh, and, and he talked about ventilators. So sh- social distancing, testing, masks, and ventilators. And in, in many ways, he when he when Cuomo said that New York needed thirty thousand ventilators, that was scary. But but it was also very specific. He used research, not guessing, and it's achievable. He also said, "Here's what government can do, and here's what government can't do. Government can lift regulations so we can experiment." So, for example, he's allowing an entrepreneur who is trying to retrofit a diving mask as a, as a ventilator, he said, yes, we'll buy some of those. We're going to experiment. And I think it, it has galvanized people so that, so that it's almost like um, people know what they can do to help and they're doing it. Yeah, that's true. Uh, You know, for the last 10 years, uh, people keep asking me when we're going to teach our politicians how to improvise. Yeah. Um, and it feels like it's always felt like a daunting, impossible task. And um, how fantastic would it be if there was sort of uh, constant bipartisan uh, action on behalf of everyone, no matter, you know, wh- whose stripe you are. Uh, but this also speaks beautifully to the first thing we were going to talk about, which is building trust through caring and challenging. So, yes. when Kim, when you what are the first things you think of when you think about building trust? It's, it's really interesting. I think at the very core of leadership is building trust. And Ryan Smith, who is the CEO of a company called Qualtrics, which some of you may know, was one of the people who I coached who who zeroed in on this very early in his tenure as as CEO. In one of our first coaching sessions, he asked me, he said, I've just hired this new team. How can I build trust quickly with that team so that we can get great things done? And so do you mind if I read something from my book? Because I oh, love please. improvising, but I also love editing. And <laughs> I feel like yes, every... Okay, so so here's what I said about how to build. Here's the answer I sort of gave Ryan about how to build trust quickly. First of all, a, qu- a quote from John Stuart Mill, the source of everything respectable in man, either as an intellectual or a moral, I think what he really meant is people, not man, to edit John Stuart Mill. But anyway, the source of everything respectable in man is either an intellectual, either as an intellectual being or as a moral being, is that his errors are corrigible. He is capable of rectifying his mistakes by discussion and experience. 
not by experience alone. There must be discussions to show how experience is to be interpreted. And this, I think, is so important in a crisis. Love is important, but truth is also really important. So let's think about what that means for your leadership and how to build trust as a leader. Challenging others and encouraging them to challenge you helps build trust, trusting relationships, because it shows, one, you care enough to point out both the things that aren't going well and those that are, and two, that you are willing to admit when you're wrong and that you're committed to fixing mistakes that you or others have made. But because challenging often involves disagreeing or saying no, this approach embraces conflict rather than avoiding it. So it's so tempting in a crisis to avoid conflict, but resolving conflict and resolving it quickly is one of the things that we can do to build trust. So in in improvisation, uh, trust is at the root of our ensembles. So we don't use the word team, we use the term ensemble, uh, which implies that there are uh, values, ethics, and behaviors that everyone has to adhere to in order for the group to be successful. Um, Everyone's probably heard the phrase, your group is only as good as its weakest member. Uh, We don't believe that. What we believe is your group is only as good as its ability to compensate for its weakest member. Because at any point, one of us is going to be the weakest member. I mean, if you start throwing math problems at me, I am the weakest member. <laughs> if you want me to talk about improv, I'm not the weakest member. But, you know, again, we don't live in static times. And especially we, we know that in a crisis. And I think it was Ernest Hemingway, I think, who said the best way to find out if you uh, uh, can trust someone is to trust them. Yes. Um, that st- st- starting with intent, uh, thinking good intent. Um, we very often move into our fear brain. Um, that is how we were um, uh, built. You know, we, we have been uh, running on the savannah much longer than we've been running for the bus, right? So we're built in uh, to recognize these dangers. So when you know that, um, you need to do the switch. And I, I love this phrase, replace blame with curiosity. Um, uh, but, you know, that's often a very hard and tricky thing uh, to navigate. I think of the, the study that Amy Edmondson did, and she coined the term psychological safety, which is all about trust. So she was a grad student uh, at Harvard, and they were studying high-performance nursing teams at this hospital outside of Boston. And they had su- assumed that the highest-performing teams would make the fewest mistakes, But what they discovered was actually the highest performing team made the most mistakes. So she had to dig in and figure out what was going on. And it took her a little while, but then what she figured out was it wasn't that the uh, uh, lowest performing teams were making the fewest mistakes, it's that they weren't reporting their mistakes at all. So this is at the root, one of the worst things that can happen in a crisis or frankly, anytime is organizational silence. And so, and radical candor itself is the enemy of organizational silence. Um, and I think this, this, you know, our marriage of sort of improv practice and radical candor theory is what, what makes this like a superpower uh, in my mind. Um, so let's also talk about uh, the next thing that we had here, which is transparency and authenticity. Um, Kim, wh- where do you come down on that? What's, what's, what's important about that? So transparency, showing what you do know is so, so, so important, especially right now. The leaders who are sharing the facts and figures uh, with with their teams are the leaders who are building trust with with their teams. The leaders who are saying, I'm going to show you exactly our runway. I'm going to show you, you know, how much money we have so that we can all develop a plan to move through this crisis together are the, the, the teams that, that are really coming together to come up with the most innovative solutions. So I think that transparency is really vital in terms of information. I also think that privacy is important in terms of building relationships. So taking the time to have those private conversations uh, it, those, those one-on-one meetings, which we'll talk about later, is also really important. Uh, at, at the same time, authenticity is really important, equally as important as transparency. Yeah, I mean, vulnerability is a strength. Yeah. I, I, I don't understand when people don't. It, 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 is, it takes courage to be vulnerable. Um, and we know from our work with the behavioral science community, human beings desire to be seen and heard. 
That is what yes. they're looking for. Nature abhors a vacuum. In times like this, people assume silence equals bad news. It instills fear. Um, but when leaders are transparent and authentic, their teams assume that good intent we were talking about, uh, which means their teams won't be working out of fear. And you can't innovate or be creative when you're working out of your fear brain. I, I oversaw Second City auditions for decades, and we'd see thousands of people, right, just coming off the street. And as they would walk up on the stage, I would mark down the people who were not going to make it because it was easy because they were shaking, literally sweating or like yeah. they, they were not. And it's not it's not that like the Tina Fey's and the Stephen Colbert's and the Steve Carell's weren't nervous before going in, but they found a practice by which to turn their stress into positive stress to be a peak performer. My friend Allison Wood Brooks at Harvard I was talking to her one time about the fact that I was out doing public speaking when my book came out. And then I got nervous, like everyone does. And he goes, I got a trick for you. Um, before you go up speaking, don't say out loud you're nervous. Say out loud, I'm excited. And it <laughs> literally, I do it now all the time. Um, it just put, it does switches the brain a little bit and gets you in that performance mode. There's a tradition at Second City, too. Before we go on stage... For any show um, or before we enter like a, a workshop, uh, this is when we could be in a room together, uh, we'd pat each other on the back and say, got your back. Um, and and you, it's, did, it's, you did this for me and kind of, sorry to interrupt, I can't help yeah, myself, no. but you did it for me in a virtual way right before the beginning of this because I was a little nervous. I haven't, this is as Brene Brown said, uh, FFT, uh, I think <laughs> that means fucking first time or yep. now second time. And I said I was nervous. And you told me, say, I'm excited. And, and using your fear, to channeling the energy of your fear and the energy to be creative, but it, it made a big difference. And then telling me that you had my back also really mattered. So thank you. It works. Yeah, and it, saying. it does work. And, and, you know, look, I have some firsthand knowledge about being highly vulnerable in a crisis because I've lived there for the last two years. Um, in 2018, my daughter Nora was diagnosed with cancer. We spent a year fighting it and she passed away in August. And Kim knows she's been along this journey with us. One of the things that we did was we took all this knowledge that we have from science and all our improv stuff and we messaged and we blogged every day and we asked for help when we needed it. And what happened was we built a community um, that didn't exist before. And it was many different communities, friends, you know, people you know that I, I met once uh, suddenly jumped in and they were able to send these messages, whether they're videos or gifts or whatever, so that Nora, like this last year, as terrible as it was, it had meaning. And, and, and in, in the absence of meaning ruins everything. It kills everything. So at least we had that. And Kim, I mean, Kim, you saw this, I, I think, you know, from, yeah. from your vantage point, right? It was really, it was incredible. And I, I think the important thing to remember is that when you told people what was going on and when you asked for help, your asking for help was actually an act of generosity because everyone around you loved you and wanted to help and didn't know what to do. And so allowing us to know enough about what was going on to know how we could help was a real act of, of generosity and, and leadership. And I think so you can thank see you. that, 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 that. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that 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 idea right now is is when you are truthful with your people, um, when you ask for their help, they will do it. And I'm seeing this at, at Second City. I mean, like these these things that we're building, like no one is saying no. I mean, everyone is jumping in and supporting each other. And it's a beautiful thing. But we have some practical tips we want to share for folks. So do you want to give yours uh, uh, and then I'll give mine? Sure, absolutely. So first of all, if you're doing a one-on-one -on -one meeting, whether it's a, whether, I mean, if you're doing any kind of meeting, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one meeting or a staff meeting, begin with a check-in. Take just a moment, and it doesn't have to take tons and tons of time, but take a moment to see how people are doing, because we all are seeing into one another's lives in a way that we never have before. It's very unusual. I was talking to someone who said, they were on a call with their boss and their boss's kid ran through and all of a sudden their their boss seemed like much more of a vulnerable human being. So we're literally seeing into one another's living rooms. And if you take a moment to check in with people, that actually turns what could be a stress and a distraction into a positive. So take the check-in time. Uh, if you're if you have a team, I would recommend doing shorter one-on-one -on -one meetings instead of a once a week one-on-one -on -one meeting, have three 10-minute meetings. Uh, 
every week because a lot happens in a week right now and you don't get the kind of texture of what's going on for people right now that you did before when you just would walk by them and kind of see how they were. So so try having shorter meetings. Also, sometimes shorter meetings are easier to fit into home chaos for people, I think. And a third tip is be conscious of what you can do asynchronously because that tends to be more efficient and convenient and what you need to do synchronously. So, so tasks can get done asynchronously. Bonding needs to be synchronous. So there are times when I think if you have a team, if you have a big team in a different time zone, occasionally work on that time zone. It's a little bit of a pain in the neck. You're, you're up at odd hours, but you create more synchronous time for them. Uh, if, if you can do that, if you can pull that off. Um, and finally, make listening tangible. Be very conscious also of how much time everyone is speaking. There's evidence that shows that teams on which everyone speaks roughly the same amount of time uh, actually perform better than those where one person dominates. So if you want, get yourself an app and measure how much, what percentage of a meeting you talk. And if you talk more than your fair share, learn how to shut up a little bit. That's my struggle. And if you talk less than your fair share, Remember that you're not doing anybody any favors to withhold your thoughts. Sharing your thoughts is an act of generosity. Those are my five. I got one of those apps and the the results were not pretty. Um, (laughs) I I had to learn to shut up. That's something we share, a pain we share. Yes, that's Uh, why we have fun talking. Yeah, exactly. Here are my five. Uh, Listen to the end of everyone's sentence before you respond. So in improvisation, we have an actual exercise where, where you can't start, you have to start the, your sentence with the last word the other person said, and then they have to do the same. Try that exercise and you are going to realize that you don't listen to the end of sentences. You start planning your response, but yeah, listen to the end. You might, you know, learn some information. Should we try uh, it? Seed. <laughs> oh, you want to do it? Yeah, let's try it. All let's right. Sh- hey, Kim, uh, the webinar is going pretty well, I think. Thinking is really important right now because it's so easy to get stuck in your lizard brain. Brain is a thing that we have talked about. It's important not to be in fear. It's even more important not to live in shame. Shame is really a counterproductive emotion. Let's try to let it go. Go is what we're going to do in about 30 minutes when this webinar ends. Seeing. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. We improvised. We I normally improvised. hate it when people ask me to improvise. I enjoyed that. That okay. was fun. So you all should try it with your teams. Try it. It's, it's a good exercise. Um, see the need to be right. Avoid group mind. Instead, utilize group intelligence. We've all seen the studies on the importance of diversity um, in groups. You want different points of view. Speak truth to power. Those sorts of things. Make sure there's a clear meeting agenda and that everyone is actually aware of it. Um, I'm saying this virtually because it's really, really important, but you will also recognize that we needed it before. (laughs) So if we learn anything out of this nightmare, it will be like shorter meetings with clear agendas that everyone knows in advance. Um, Designate one person to lead and run the meeting. These virtual meetings are a performance. You are on a stage and you need a director. You do not want directorless ensembles running around. That is dangerous. Um, And keeping in line with the performance aspect, uh, good lighting, uh, facing towards a window is good. Um, No need to be in a suit and tie, but don't wear a bathrobe. Um, Pick a good stage, a spot in your home that is as quiet as possible, and you won't be distracted or become a distraction to others. But then also recognize, use the cute dog or cat coming in. (laughs) Let your kids say hi. We we actually love that. That has happened on so many of my meetings, and it, it is made for, as Kim said before, a real authentic experience. Uh, So those are some of our tips for you. I know that Jason is assembling uh, some questions right now. Um, And so one more exchange and then we'll we'll jump to him. But one of the things that are also one of the vehicles that we haven't talked about, we've talked a lot about improvisation, but not so much about comedy. It's a very memorable way to get your message across. This is why so many Super Bowl ads are comedy ads. But the reality too is there are so many people producing comedy ads who are not 
experts in comedy. Um, this, I, I, I don't understand how people are allowed to, you know, uh, produce this kind of comedy without a license. Um, and at Second City, we've all undergone immense training. I mean, just years and years of practice in front of audiences, crafting comic messages. And when it is done well, um, the results are amazing. We, you know, the office really could be a training program uh, for things that are, are wrong in the work world. All right, Jason, you got some uh, questions for us? I do. Um, let's see, where, where would I like to start? So uh, a very tactical question first, uh, mostly for, for you, Kelly. Uh, are, do you have any thoughts about how to practice this idea of follow the follower virtually? Is there is there a, 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 an idea or a, a brainstorm that you might have to help teams do that? Yeah, I thought about this uh, the other day because many of you, I assume, have these maybe somewhat small team meetings that are now happening shorter throughout, I think we should pick a different person to run the meeting every time. So in doing that, everyone gets practice in being the leader and moving in around. And so if they're not good at it, that can be figured out. We can deal with that. And if they're very good at that, at that we can sort of applaud it. Uh, it, it. Kim, you mentioned my wife, Anne. My wife knows how to run a meeting. Like like literally at her, she's at Columbia College. They, at a certain point, were like, can you just run these meetings? And because she knows how to move the ball around and, and, and get everyone sort of input. And then when to stop, like stop the, you know, I constantly in, the, in various meetings, I know we all experience this, like everyone needs to say the same thing like five times. And it's like, no, nope, we don't. One time and we agree and we move on. So that's my quick tip. I love that. Um, next question, uh, curious how you both think about practicing radical candor with someone who seems at least to be unwilling to accept the, the sort of impact of their actions. And so I, I think, you know, Kim, you, you referred to this as sort of speaking truth to power, um, thought, thoughts about that, especially in this moment, because I, I think maybe those actions are causing extra harm. Yeah, those those actions can be causing enormous harm. So how would if 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 you had the boss who installed malware on everybody's computer, how do you go to this boss and tell this boss that that's a terrible, terrible, unproductive idea? So I th I think a couple of things are important. One is no matter who you're speaking to, whether it's your boss, your peer, your employee, your spouse, your partner, your child. It's important to start by soliciting feedback. Don't don't dish it out until you prove you can take it. And there are, are a couple of reasons for that. One is you want to make sure that you understand where that person is coming from and that you are you give yourself the opportunity to express some compassion for where that person is coming from. That boss who installed the malware probably wasn't the raging asshole that he seems to be from his action. He probably was really afraid about what was going to happen when, when, not, when everybody wasn't in the same place at the same time. So making sure that you understand where that person is coming from is important and, and what that person feels about your actions, like what you might be doing or not doing that's contributing to the situation. So start by soliciting. Doesn't have to be some long drawn out root canal conversation. It can just be a couple of minutes. Uh, and, and then you wanna make sure that you focus on the good stuff. I think it is, it is so important, especially if you in that relationship maybe have a little bit of, sometimes we have technical debt, other times we have feedback debt. And when there's feedback debt in a relationship, when somebody has been doing something that has been bothering you for a long, long time, there comes a point where that's all you can see about that person and you've forgotten about all the things that you actually appreciate about working with that person. So if you try to take a step back, take a deep breath and remember the good stuff, focus on the good stuff for a moment, then it becomes easier to say, look, there's something that's bothering me is now a good time to tell you. So if you kind of follow that operate order of operations, solicit feedback, focus on the good stuff. Again, all of these are two minute conversations. I'm not talking about a Six Sigma rollout. Uh, then it becomes easier to offer some candid criticism in a way that is both helpful and humble. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, I think that's, that's right on. I, I was thinking about this also at an organizational level. So if you have some power in your organization to make things happen, you need to set up some structures where truth can be spoken to power. Um, and where also uh, you can sort of um, signal 
uh, the the values that you want to uh, uh, embark have your people embark upon. So uh, Basecamp does a thing where at the I think at the end of every year they do an award show for the biggest failure. Uh, basically, as a way to signal we want you to risk and try things. It's good, and we're going to celebrate this failure. At the Second City, we have a far more direct truth to power thing, and it's called the Second City Holiday Party. And what happens at the holiday party is the staff, night staff and day staff, non actors, put on a show. <laughs> that basically lampoons all the executives. It, it is a show built to make fun of me and ownership. Um, and uh, they, they use the sort of uh, shell of whatever current material is up and it's songs and sketches. And I remember one year, this is a long while ago, um, the wait staff uh, put on this song uh, that they sang directly to our owner, Andrew Alexander, where they said to him, you, you can dress up a pair of jeans, but why, do, why does this staff not have health insurance? And this is like the part time wow. people. Um, and our Mike Conway, who was our general manager at the time, was just sinking in his chair like, I'm going to get they're going to get fired. I'm going to get fired. But that didn't happen. What happened was the next day, Andrew brought all of us, the executive team in and said, how do we get them insurance? And we got them insurance. I mean, this so so that would not have happened if there weren't a format. Um, so that's important to think about. Think about if you have uh, some leadership opportunities, create formats for truth to be spoken to power. Yeah, creating not not just a format, but like you gave people the stage quite literally. So you yeah, want to literally. think about you want to think about ways to give people the stage to to talk to you in yeah. in a way that is that that works for your organization. Uh, I used to use this thing called whoops a daisy, where I'd bring in a stuffed daisy and and ask people to confess the biggest mistake they made that week. And I would, of course, start with my screw up. And it was like there was a big celebration of who screwed up the worst that week. And it simple things like that can really make failure safe and create a more innovative organization. So what was your biggest whoopsie daisy this week? Oh, wow. That is a good question. I think my, my biggest whoopsie daisy this week was <laughs> I've been trying to teach my children to diagram sentences because that's what I learned to do in fifth grade. And I really, uh, I really kind of started, I lost my temper with them a little bit in a way that was not productive. And my, my son actually wrote, and then I asked them to write a paragraph in their journal. And my son wrote uh, that, mom, this is a pandemic. Everyone is stressed. Just relax a little bit. So (laughs) <laughs> I got a little bit of radical candor from him. You did. All right. My biggest whoops daisy was I uh, did a podcast taping. Oh, this uh, is a good story. Zoom technology. Um, and then I'm on my last question when I look up and realize I never hit record. Um, so I finished my, I, fin- I haven't told these guys yet. I just, co- I couldn't, I, had, I finished the podcast. I thanked them. And then I told Kim about it and she's like, you got to tell them. So I will, it, <laughs> they'll, they'll find out this week. Yeah. Now you have to, cause you've just, now I have to. Yeah, yeah, I did actually, I did something that is worth mentioning because I think other people might do the same thing. So this is a smaller, less important whoops, but it could have ended disastrously. I was uh, again, sort of racing around in the morning, trying to get breakfast going. And and I put on the tea kettle for my husband's tea that I was going to slide under his door. And, and I didn't pay any attention. I just flipped it on and a wooden spoon was sticking into the gas and it, it caught on fire. And I walked away and I walked back and I mean, the spoon was half burnt. It could have ended very badly. So, uh, so slow down everybody and pay attention to what you're doing uh, because it, that, that whoops could have had a less happy ending than just my daughter yelling at me for not being careful. Uh, that is great. Uh, that, that is great and super <laughs> timely advice. Um, everybody's probably checking their stoves right now to make sure there are no <laughs> spoons burning. Um, yeah, we need our house I, not right now like never before. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I, I heard from someone recently that there's no such thing as a two-part question, but I'm going to try to ask one. Basically, any two-part question is really just two questions, but they're thematically very related. So the two related questions are, how, how does this work, right? How does vulnerability, compassion, and honesty work in, this, in the transition to, 
virtually mediated conversations? Like what should we be, what should be on our minds as we do that? I think uh, you, during your conversation, you, uh, you talked about, we can kind of see into each other's houses now. And so there's like this, this earned vulnerability or maybe this sort of unearned vulnerability that people are are being sort of forced to to be a part of. Um, So how do we think about that? And I think the second question is, uh, the related question is, what can we do to practice? So like we, we recognize that this is different. What, are we, what should we be trying to improve? And then do you have any suggestions about what we could practice to help us get better? Yeah, you want to take the first part? I'll take the second part. Sure. I think well, like uh, one of my favorite examples yesterday came from uh, so, a woman who I think she was, she's either I'm not sure whether she was a senator or a congresswoman, but she was on a call and with with a bunch of other with a bunch of other uh, uh, senators and 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 Congress people, and she thought she was on mute, and she called out to her daughter, uh, "Go to the potty and wash your hands. Mommy will be down in a minute." Like, she, yeah, she tweeted this, and she said that there were two former presidential candidates on the call. Uh, and then Amy Klobuchar said that was my favorite part of the meeting. And so I think all of a sudden uh, our our humanity, whether we intend for it to be or don't intend for it to be, is on display. And and so and I think very often, especially for a woman, we try to pretend like these domestic things are not interfering in our work. And, and it, you, you can't pretend anymore right now. And I thought the courage to not only laugh at it in the moment, but to tweet it out and to share it publicly because so many other people are having these experiences. And, and that's a funny example. I mean, I think Jason actually on on a call with the Radical Candor team, with the Radical Candor team and people, you showed a lot of vulnerability as a leader describing an experience that that you and your and and your wife had had where and we all started crying all everyone on that call uh teared up and it was really uh, an important moment for us to have because we all needed a cry i told my husband afterwards about the call and he teared up as well uh and so i think that um b- being willing to show vulnerability and to to laugh and cry together is is more important than ever so I think about this when I look at like the World Economic Forum always gives out their future of work skills list. And if you look on there, like coding is not on the list. The The list includes like divergent thinking, problem solving, innovation, creativity. I mean, I, I remember most of the, the, what it is. And these are all the things that are deeply human because we are entering the technology age where we are. The robots are going to be doing a lot of our work. And so the work that's going to be left is all the stuff that is most human. And the problem is we don't practice being human. Yes. We don't practice listening. Uh, We don't practice speaking. But what's so odd about this is like the arts gets this. We rehearse. Sports gets this. Like these billion or millionaire baseball players, um, you know, they play catch because it is that important in terms of practicing skills. And this is different than role playing. And I'm not putting down role playing. It has its place. But it's like if you're scrimmaging all the time, that doesn't work. You have skills that you need to bring in to your performance and they change. So if you go to the back of our, our my, uh, the book I co-wrote with Tom Yorton, Yes And, we actually just list out like a bunch of these improv exercises. The Yes And game, we already talked to you about the uh, one that they listening to the or saying the last word. That's an important one. Uh, one thing that we did, and we do this with kids, our kids all the time was we would say one, we do a game called one word story. Well, we t- tell a story one word at a time. And this was to get them to stop fighting in the back of the car, but it also taught them how to share a conversation. So I think that this idea is we have to be more human, um, which means that we have to pay attention to what it means to be human, which involves practice. I think that is so important. Practicing, practicing our humanity we do need drills. This is one of the things I learned after after Radical Candor was published is that, it again, it's so easy for me to say be radically candid, so hard to do it. It's hard for me to do it. That's why I wrote the book. It's not like it's easy for me either. And 
One of the things I've loved about working with you in the Second City, Kelly, is that you do have these humanity drills, like these very specific ways to practice very specific skills. It's not the whole conversation, but here's how you practice listening. Here's how you here's how you practice responding when you don't like what you heard when you listen. And I think it has been great fun to begin to break down the skills and give people some some drills and specific human skills. Yeah, I mean, we talked about meaning, the importance of meaning earlier. Meaning is made in moments. They're yes. made in these interactions. And they're also, culture can be broken in moments. When yes. You have that. And we're all going to do it. So, like, recognize your mistake rate. This is the analogy I always give, which is, like, if you go into a job interview and you failed 70% of the time, you probably think you're going to be fired. Um, but if you're a Major League Baseball player and your batting average uh, is... I mean, you know, then you're hitting 300. I mean, it's like the we we make more mistakes than we get it right. So we are yes. in experimentation, especially right now. So you you have another shot at it. You can use your other shot at it. And this means that you have to do it in this sort of, and this is why the radical candor framework is so great. It gives you the cue. Care personally so you can challenge directly. Just keep thinking about that. Show your care, then you can challenge. Love and truth. Love and truth. And we will get through this together. I think that's a that, that's a, a really great place uh, to to end the conversation today. Uh, Want to sh- thank you both uh, and thank everybody for taking the time to join us for this discussion. Um, we are incredibly grateful to have had the opportunity to spend this hour with you. See you next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming. It was great to have a moment of community with everyone. Thanks for joining us. Our podcast features Radical Candor co-founders Kim Scott and Jason Rosoff, is produced by our director of content, Brandy Neal, and hosted by me, Amy Sandler. Music is by Cliff Goldmacher. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Candor and find us online at RadicalCandor.com. We'll see you soon.